Hi, Laura. Thank you Hi, so good much morning. for joining me. Good morning. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's so good to, good to be with you this morning. Um, I'm very excited to share more information about the older adult dance movement therapy class that you're offering. This is a 15 hour course and that it can be taken for 15 hours of continuing education units NBCC continuing education units, which is awesome and it's also a really valuable part of the alternate route uh, curriculum that we're offering. So people prospective dance movement therapists who want to be informed about older adults can take this class and working specifically with DMT with older adults. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if you could give us a little bit of a sense of what students can expect coming into your class. Sure, absolutely. So as you said, it's a 15 hour course. So if you're taking this course for um, alternate route credits, it's a one credit course. If you want to join us for the purpose of um, continuing education, whether that's because you are an alternate route student who already has you know, some sort of credentialing or licensure, or you're not, but you just want to take, take the course for continuing ed purposes, then you'd get 15 hours um, because we're an NBCC continuing ed provider at this point, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to come together and spend time, you know, doing some of the nitty gritty learning in terms of some of the different theories on aging, developmental theories on aging. We'll touch on a little bit. Some of the nuts and bolts that we have to cover, like the mandated reporter aspects, the ethics around um, elder abuse, some of the legal responsibilities that we have to providing care for our older adults in our communities. I think we, our, our brains generally, you know, go to children in terms of thinking about abuse and, and mandated reporting, but there are responsibilities that we have to our older adult population as well. We're going to touch on that. And we're going to um, cover facets of typical aging. As we all know, aging comes with a lot of changes um, on a lot of different levels, right? Our body changes. <laughs> Um, our identity changes if we stop working or once we maybe aren't necessarily like raising children or whatever. Um, lots of emotional and psychological changes might happen as our roles shift. Um, you know, things as, as people start to maybe become a little more isolated as their communities shrink down a little bit, or they start to experience more frequent loss. There's a lot on a lot of different levels, right? The, the biopsycho and social are touched on even just with typical aging. Um, and then we have some of the less typical things that might happen too, which are, you know, mobility changes that are a little more unique, like a Parkinson's disease diagnosis or something like that. Not everybody who is an older adult is going to experience something like that. Um, so we'll touch a little bit on some of those shifts or illnesses. Um, and then the broad category of dementia, right? We've got Alzheimer's disease and a variety of other kinds of dementia. Um, now we're referring to neurocognitive decline since the last issue of the DSM came out, right? And so that that umbrella of dementia and the different kinds, we're going to learn some of the facts about that, but we're going to spend lots of time embodying ways to be with folks who are facing um, all of these issues, typical aging, other sorts of um, illnesses, as well as the umbrella of dementia, right? We're going to learn a lot about what person-centered care, according to Thomas Kitwood, is, which was initially um, literature, research that was specifically dementia-focused. But whenever I introduce it to students, I talk about, like, it's really just about people, right? Like, the things that people with dementia need and the ways that best uphold their personhood it's true for all of us right oh hello Sorry. um <laughs> so we're gonna learn you know basic tenets and principles of that theory um and we're gonna practice embodying them and considering them like how do we look at them as therapy intervention how do we conduct a dance movement therapy session in a way that that has that on as our our lens or our our, our pair of glasses um, we'll do some simulated sessions. I love the experience. I think there's such rich, deep learning when we take time in a course to have each student 
facilitate a session while the rest of us embody what we can, you know, with the deepest respect for experiencing, trying to experience a simulation of what might go on for these folks as clients or participants. Um, we're going to do a little bit of experiential learning related to sort of like sensory deprivation experiences, trying to, to just embody a little, what would it, you know, what would it be like to have our vision begin to decrease or to really be experiencing some hearing loss or, um, you know, mobility limitations, things like that. Um, yeah, that's what comes to mind. So we'll spend a, a nice intense weekend together, Friday night, all day, Saturday, all day, Sunday, um, touching on all those things. And so, um, coming out of the course, what are, um, what are some of the things that students will kind of be able to take with them? What are the, what are the kind of, uh, gems that they'll take? Um, I think the experience of using movement create like of course right big big fat duh in terms of a dance movement therapy course but like using movement creatively and expressively to meet the needs that come to mind when we think about working with older adults like you will have approaches that you can take through your own movement your own body your own conceptualization um, back to that work. I would also add sort of as an aside that, and this isn't going to happen for everyone, but I have had a fairly consistent experience of people who don't necessarily see themselves loving this population as a clinical choice for themselves, finding some new, uh, finding new perspective on what it might be like to work with older adults, right? That even though they think it's something that maybe they come in thinking, wow, this work is probably so sad because there's all this death and all this decline and aging. And then to find the richness um, and the beauty of being able to be with people at this end of life stage um, or that, you know, there's so much still available despite how much loss might, might be there or how much decline might be experienced. And yet there's still such richness um, that can be tapped into. And so that would be, that would be something that I'm not, I can't promise you'll have that experience, but many students do where if they're not someone who's already like, I super dig older adults, you might come away from the course with a new perspective on what you think you'd get out of it or, or seeing that idea differently for yourself as a clinician. Mm -hmm. And, and why is dance movement therapy, this unique approach? Like, what is it about dance therapy that um, helps with this population in particular? Well, I, you know, it's, it's the nonverbal emphasis, right? That the, the use of nonverbal commu communication, the emphasis on the body and the movement without the words, that's where it's at. If we're talking about dementia specifically, language is one of the areas that can become really impaired, right? We have, um, people experience aphasia, people, um, you know, if they speak multiple languages, they may, they, they start to, and you know, again, this is a generalization, of course, not everyone experiences this, uh, but if they speak multiple languages, they may lose the languages that they've acquired later. Um, and so become more limited in like a native language that they spoke. Um, people's access to words becomes reduced. So sometimes people get to a point where they can really only answer, you know, yes or no sorts of things. Um, and so the, the focus on being with, being in relationship where the nonverbal is leading the way really kind of expands the access, right? There's so many more access points to connecting, to finding meaning, to sharing emotional energy with someone, right? To be able to, to, to convey, I'm with you. Maybe if they were talking about a caregiver, a family caregiver, to be able to express the, I love you. Um, the, I respect you, um, providing autonomy and empowerment, you know, you being able to come in, in the nonverbal and, and create experiences where people can make decisions for themselves still, right? If we, if we look around in older adults, nursing home setting, there's a, it's like being in the hospital. There's a lot of interactions where folks have no choice 
no choice about when someone will help them in the bathroom, no choice about what their food's going to be today. No, right. Like there's so much taking away of choice and autonomy. And you know, that's, I'm not, it's, it's not a blame statement. It's just a fact of the environment. Um, but coming in in this nonverbal manner and in, into dance therapy where we can provide choices and options and, uh, you know, that there's room for all opinions and preferences. Um, it's another strength of the work, in my opinion. Mm, that's really beautiful. I, I have a memory of a woman that I was working with when I was with you at a day facility. Um, I was your intern. Yeah. <laughs> And then you left thousands of years ago. <laughs> and then you abandoned me to get married and go on a honeymoon. Um, yeah. And and this this woman, she was very composed, generally, didn't have access to a ton of words. Um we were doing this thing where I was kind of just like going around to each person and, and touching their hands and looking at them. And I think the physical contact is one of those things that a lot of times older adults can be starved for, you know, and, and I just had this moment where I touched her hands and this woman, I don't know what it was, but there was something that she needed to get out. And she just like pressed into my hands and growled and did like a audible, you know, an audible release of tension, frustration. And then she turned right back into that beautifully composed, like, prim and proper lady uh -huh. and it was this moment where I recognized oh there's this there is potential also for things that may not need to be talked about mm -hmm. yet processed through the body mm -hmm. this is standard this is like what a lot of people are are working with in 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 trauma sure. you know? And I'm not saying this woman had trauma. I don't. I don't necessarily think that. But I do think that what she was doing was she was she was accessing and releasing something in her body, and we didn't have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just something that she moved out, and then we moved on. Right. Right. Well, and I think um, generationally, as well as many different cultures, right? There's lots of cultural, endless cultural influences, um, but there's also the generational influences on what's acceptable to share, to make public, to have ever said out loud, potentially, right? Things people have been through that never were given space or permission to talk about or to be safe enough. And so, right, like, again, we don't know that that was anything traumatic, but even the idea of this proper lady having some aggressive energy that needed, you know, uh, expression, that interaction gave permission for that aggression to come out um, in a way that might not have been ever sort of supported or explored, right? Um, and so, you know, the cultural piece, the, the generational piece around how we're expected to be socially maybe meant that there was never room for anger or aggression to, to be portrayed. Um, but just that little hand-to-hand -hand moment, you know, like opened a door let something come out that may have been there for eons who knows mm -hmm. um but yeah and i love and i love that it, it, there's also the part around um you know the ex experience of aging can be really frustrating really sad um really confusing all of those things and and it might not be easy to talk about any of those and yet we can support through dance therapy through the nonverbal through embodiment like we can support space for that to come forth, um, to normalize it too, right? That nobody has to be ashamed or private necessarily about the fear or the confusion or the frustration around what's happening to them, right? Because aging happens to us, right? Like we don't, nobody's choosing it. Mm -hmm. um, it's happening to us. Right. Absolutely. Um, so this course is um, <clears throat> is not specifically focused on cognitive decline. It <clears throat> encompasses, excuse me, <clears throat> it encompasses all older adults, um, nor you know, like development um, and the the process of providing support to aging in general. But um, could you speak to the specific focus on um, Alzheimer's because that is something that 
a lot of uh, licensure boards or um, licensures are, re are requiring um, a specific course on Alzheimer's. Yes. So for us specifically in Illinois, that's a fairly new continuing education requirement. They kind of keep adding how many hours of specific things we need every renewal, right? And so that's one of our newer ones that you have to have at least one hour every renewal period of Alzheimer's disease education. And the language around it is very broad. It's about diagnosing, treating, and caring for people with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, but it applies to anyone who works with, in a, in a um, health capacity with folks who are 26 or older. So it's really like, unless you're a clinician who very much 100% only works with kids and, and adolescents, it applies to you, right? Um, which makes sense because we keep having more and more older adults, right? We have better health care all the time, which means we recover from more things. We survive and outlive more things, which is wonderful. Um, but it also means that people are living longer, which means we just keep having more older adults. Um, the primary risk factor for dementia is age. The older you get, the higher your chance of getting it becomes. That's just that's just the math part of it. Um, plus, as we know, our baby boomers are are there already, right? So this this massive boom of folks um, is at this place. So we've got a, a big group of folks kind of entering into this territory. Um, so in terms of the need to have at least one hour of diagnosis, treatment, or care of folks with individuals or folks with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias, we're going to cover plenty more than that, right? So yes, this is a broader scope course focused on older adults, including typical issues of aging and across a spectrum of, of things. But we're going to spend plenty more than one hour of the 15 on um, concepts related to the treatment of and care for folks who are experiencing um, neurocognitive decline. And so, you know, come on board. I will, I, we can, we're, we're going to give you more than you need um, across the course of this 15 hours. It's not solely focused in that space, um, but we'll cover a, a nice depth of information that will fully meet that requirement. Beautiful. And then, and, and it's going to be such a different experience than most education people will have access to in this space. Most education in this space is not going to invite you into your body to try to inhabit or inhabit um, losing one of the five senses or, you know, so you're, you're, right. um, you're offering a very unique opportunity for students to engage this, understand it, um, and practice, practice yeah. care and response. Right. The practical application piece, right? All our experiential learning it, it, so much. I mean, that's probably not fair. Our experiential learning emphasis supports that transfer into um, application in your job setting, right? And so come into class, do experiential learning in this way, bring the, the intervention ideas and the concepts into your body, and then take them home and put them into, into use. You know, it's not just like I'm, I'm taking notes in my didactic learning about percentages and, and whatnot, and then, you know, putting my notes away <laughs> when I go home, which not everybody does. Okay. I'm, I'm doing a broad stroke there, but um, that happens a lot with kind of our lecture focused work, right? So get in here and let's get it in you. And, and then you can take it, take it back to your work, wherever it is that you're, you're working. Sounds so good. Thank you so much, Laura. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, yeah. Look forward to heaven. Anybody who wants to join us. It's always richer the more we have. Beautiful.